Welcome to the FAA Production Studios and the FAA Safety Teams National Resource Center in Sun Fun Complex located in Lakeland, Florida. Our next presenter is retired from the Cirrus Design Program where he was an air safety investigator and was director of the air safety training for the past 16 years. He is a member of the International Society of Air Safety Investigators and teaches at the NTSB Academy at the uh, Transportation Safety Institute located in Oklahoma City. Also, he uh, makes presentations at numerous uh, fire colleges, fire departments around the country talking about what to do after the accident. Mike is a Navy, uh, Navy veteran, served as an uh, aircraft electrician and air crew member on the USS Saratoga. Uh, involved in Helicopter Support Squadron, HC-6. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in management from Emory-Riddle and worked for the Daytona Beach Fire Department as an arson investigator while finishing his degree at Emory-Riddle. He is a commercial pilot with multi-engine and instrument ratings and is a certified airframe and power plant mechanic. Mike has been a member of the EAA since 1974 and has co-founded the EA Chapter 534 in Leesburg, Florida. He's been involved in numerous aircraft restoration projects including the Collins Foundation B-24, the All-American and B-17 909 bombers from Tom Riley's Bomber Town facility in Kissimmee, Florida. Mike has owned four aircraft a 48 Stinson, a Satabria, a Long Easy that he built and raced in, in uh, Sun 60, the, uh, and a 1948 Navion. He's currently working on an F-1 rocket. His topic today is what happens when the phone rings. Let's welcome Mike Bush. Good morning, Walt. Thank you very much. I know it's kind of an unusual title. First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone to Sun and Fun and uh, everyone here in the studio for their support. Uh, I was an accident investigator for some time, and as such, we always have to carry the phone with us. And uh, people uh, always knew what I did, but they didn't know what happened after the phone rang, and I left, got out of sight. And so that question came up so often that I thought I would uh, put a little presentation together about sort of the behind-scenes things of what we do, because as you can imagine, most accident sites are, are restrictive. They don't let everybody in, and we do have to do our work. So we. Uh, <laughs> are always answering questions about that. But the question foremost in our minds is why do we investigate accidents? Well, of course, we want to learn what happened and so that we can learn from those facts and pass it along so in, in our hopes that something like that won't happen again. And uh, the other question is, of course, how do you do it? Well, it's, it's, it's a science in a way. And as many accidents as I've had to be with and investigate, I can say there's a sort of sameness about all of them. But at the same time, they're all a little different different airplanes, different locations, and different situations. So uh, there's, there's a lot of variables you have to look at. If you work for a manufacturer, uh, a certified manufacturer, uh, the NTSB, the National Transportation Association, uh, expects you to have a qualified accident investigator on call. Uh, it's part of, the, uh, part of the job that uh, a manufacturer has to uh, deal with. He has to provide the support to the NTSB. And, uh, a lot of folks don't know that the National Transportation Safety Board has jurisdiction over all civil accidents in this country. They are the boss. They're the ones in charge. But they can't possibly know everything about every airplane out there, and so they do expect us to provide some expertise on our particular airplane. And so as such, if they need us, and only if we're invited to uh, the investigation, they will call us and, and say, well, look, we need your help. Can you participate? So we wear the phone, and when the phone rings, we got to go. And I think our record in our department was 12 minutes out the door. I think my own personal record was 20 minutes. Uh, you've got to travel typically to anywhere, anytime, because you never know where these things happen. They are accidents after all. And uh, you have to be ready to provide professional assistance to these folks. The recurring questions that we also have is why did it occur? And what can we do to keep this kind of accident from uh, happening again? The board investigates the accident. Okay, they're in charge of it, they are the boss. And so when we get called, we go out there and, and we do what they ask us to do. Now typically in our case, when I was at Cirrus, uh, we were in charge of the airframe portion of the, uh, of the investigation uh, under the guidance of the NTSB. And of course, 
Uh, the other person that can be there is the engine manufacturer. In the case of a commercial airliner, you might have a representative from ALPA there. But uh, other than that, and the FAA, those are the people that are the primary investigators on site. Uh, the NTSB will write the report. You can pick these uh, reports up online. If you've uh, never done that, you should do that, ntsb.gov. Under the aviation section, you can look up accidents as far back as 1947 now, I think. Uh, they do a good job with that. And so they write the report, and uh, they're also responsible for the site and the security and the safety on the site. And uh, we always want to make sure that, uh, well, we've had one tragedy. We don't want to have another one occur with people uh, stomping around in the wreckage and so forth. It doesn't help our investigation much either when, when evidence is destroyed. It's uh, evidence and uh, uh, all the things we look at is very perishable. You know, uh, things roll downhill and animals run away with stuff or uh, it's raining and, and so forth. Uh, a lot of times the wind blows away critical papers or whatever. So we have to get there quickly and try to capture all this evidence and all this information so that we can try to make sense out of what it is we're looking at. One of the problems we have is that sometimes an airplane doesn't even look like an airplane when we get there. Now the, the main job, when it's all said and done, is that there's a five-member board on the National Transportation Safety Board that ultimately will take the report, review it, and then determine the probable cause. They're the only people in this country legally that can do that. And uh, that probable cause is determined by these five board, minute, board members. Uh, we say probable cause because uh, typically we can't get every little scrap of information that we need. Uh, we can see trends and we can put all the pieces together, but sometimes stuff is still missing and so we can't say absolute cause. We say probable cause, and by the way, even after the report is written and probable cause has been determined, uh, they will open up a case again if they get new information. And I've seen probable causes actually change from case to case because of that. And when it's all said and done, they sum up what we learned from this accident. And if there's something new, uh, they will try to make recommendations to the people they think are involved. You need to change this, improve that, in an effort to prevent these accidents from happening again. The FAA, of course, also participates in these accidents. And as a matter of fact, they uh, are involved with every single accident that the uh, NTSB does. Um, FAA is a regulatory agency. They make up the rules and enforce them. So they're the guys that can ground you or, <laughs> or take away your medical or whatnot. But more importantly and more positively, they have all the paperwork that we need uh, in the event we have an accident. We have to do some investigations. We, we want to know who the air aircraft is registered to and who owned it and uh, who the pilot was and, and what were his qualifications and so forth. So the FAA has all that data. And so as an automatic uh, policy, they are involved in every single accident as party, as we call it, to the investigation. So FAA is administrative and enforcement primarily, and uh, they, they will be uh, participating in all the accidents. It is a congressional mandate that the manufacturers may be uh, participants in this, but we do have to be invited. And so typically that phone has to ring before we can go. Now the phone can ring and it can have anybody on the other end of the phone calling us. I mean, I've had, uh, I've had uh, police officers call me. I've had, uh, you know, just civilians call me, uh, firemen. And they say, hey, you know, there's an airplane down here. We think it might be one of yours. And so the phone can ring any time. And in fact, in my case, it has rung, I think, at every hour that I can imagine. And almost any day and any time. I can't tell you how many uh, dinners I've had to get up from or movies to get away from so that I could launch to go on an accident. But the, it all starts with the telephone. So the uh, manufacturer, like Cirrus in this case, had me available and I was the one that launched. For a long time, I was the only guy. And so for 724, I had the phone and that was it. Later on, we, as we grew, uh, we had some more people in the department. We got trained up and so we, we didn't all have to carry the phone all the time. Uh, the engine manufacturer has a similar representative on hand, and typically our experience is gained uh, from a number of sources, which I'll, I'll deal with in a second here, but uh, we are qualified to, to participate in these accidents by virtue of the fact that we know the airplane really well. ALPA is also the third uh, person outside of uh, the federal uh, representatives that could be there. And uh, it doesn't guarantee that we have party status on each, uh, on each accident. We have the congressional mandate of being allowed to if they need us there. So how do the NTSB form an effective team when, the, when, you know, when they, they get the call and this uh, aircraft goes down somewhere in the middle of nowhere? How do you get all these people together on short notice and be able to run an effective team? And uh, the answer is pretty simple, really. 
it's professionalism. Everybody knows what they are supposed to do, how they're supposed to do it, and we all work very, t very closely together as a team. The NTSB are past masters at putting teams together. Uh, since they have jurisdiction, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the first responders and fire departments and law enforcement agencies aren't always sure uh, who's in charge. They always think their chief is in charge and so on. And, well, in fact, it's the NTSB that is in charge. And so the NTSB has to, um, you know, kind of take over and run the thing, but they do so very well. It's almost seamless, and they're very, very uh, professional about how they do this. And uh, we don't have a lot of time on site, and so uh, all this has to come together very quickly. Uh, we all are dedicated to this uh, industry and, and uh, uh, looking for those answers that are pretty elusive. We all have a lot of mutual respect for each other, and as you might imagine, uh, since there aren't very many of us, I would guess there's probably only 200 investigators in the whole world, uh, we pretty well know each other from time to time. We can, we can uh, count on our experience together to help us get by, too. And we help each other. Uh, the engine guy will help the airframe guy and so on and so on. And uh, over a period of time, you develop a reputation, which is very important. And so that respect is there, and, and uh, we all respect each other and really work hard. Uh, I like to say it's all about relationships. Now, this is not a good old boy system. It is all based on respect and, uh, and uh, mutual help and so forth. The uh, skill sets that are required of the accident uh, investigator are many. It's a craft which has to be developed. We don't, uh, we don't come into this world with these skills necessarily. We have to learn what it is we're doing and, and uh, what it is we're looking for, what's important. So it's a craft. And so there's a lot of mentoring and training. I remember one time uh, I was uh, at, a, at a sort of a fender bender and they invited me to come down as sort of part of my experience on job training. And, and the investigator in charge from the NTSB was about to get on a, an airplane and go back to Chicago at the time. And he said, uh, I asked him a couple of questions and he said, no, wait a minute. And he looked at his watch and he pulled out his airline schedule and we both sat down on a log and he spent the next three hours uh, mentoring me. He could have gone home earlier, but he sat there right down there and uh, walked me through how things are done. Uh, that's the kind of professionalism that you see, and there's a lot of teaching going on kind of behind the scenes. So mentoring and training is extremely important. Of course, you can't beat on-the-job experience because every accident is a little different, and uh, you learn just lots of stuff from each time. Uh, there are schools, and there are workshops, which we all participate in. When we go to these things, typically you're going to see experienced investigators and uh, we one more time get to talk outside of the accident environment about accidents and that can be very productive as well. Uh, if you're going to be an accident investigator, a lot of people don't understand that you really have to be a good communicator. Both written and technical skills, oral, verbal, you've got to be able to talk to people at any level, to ask the right questions, to listen to what it is that they're saying. So many people, uh, uh, you know, tend to think they already know what happened before they ever get to the site, and that's, that's a bad thing. You want to be very open-minded. You want to not be predisposed to any particular situation. People always ask me when I was going out the door, well, what happened? I said, I don't know, but that's what I'm going to find out. You know, we can't possibly know until we get there. So we have to be able to communicate with each other at the site, and then when we get back, we have to be able to talk to other people about it. Uh, common sense, believe it or not, is huge. You know, why is this airplane upside down? Why is it there instead of over there? Now there's an answer for it. The airplane is trying to talk to you really. Uh, just like when you're flying one, it's got all these noises and senses and stuff. You can hear the airplane if you listen, okay? Well, it's no different on site. And so common sense is important. And you have to ask those questions. Integrity, you know, you can't go down there and, and try, to, try to be all pompous and show off and tell everybody you know something because that doesn't work. I mean, all pretenses go away. And in fact, when we get on site, pretty much all the logos and badges come off. We're a team. We work together. And there's no job too small or too large for us to do. Uh, if the engine guy needs help digging his engine out of the dirt, well, we all get you know, time on the shovel and so forth. So uh, we all help each other a lot. It is a team. And you've got to be dedicated to this. And this is, this is hard, dirty work. It's not fun. Uh, you're out there for you know, a couple days, three days at a time sometimes in the middle of nowhere, terrible conditions. I know uh, one of my uh, co-workers actually spent some time uh, living in a, in a container on site because that's the only hotel that was around. So you've got to be pretty rugged and, and uh, ready to just kind of make do. Uh, so therefore you have to be flexible. You have to think about uh, uh, alternative paths and, and uh, well, gee, I would rather do this, but I'm going to do that because that's what we need to do today. And so those are the things that you look at. Uh, 
Also, you have to have pretty good imagination. So our pilot skills and our backgrounds in the industry uh, as mechanics or as pilots and so forth, you get a sense for what the pilot was going through in this accident, the victim maybe. You have to be able to visualize what was going on. Why did this thing come down here? You know, why was he going through the trees like this? So if you can visualize what happened, it, it makes it easier to understand what happened and therefore why. These are all things that we make as part of the puzzle and we, we share our views with each other. And I'm not saying we all agree. Uh, on the contrary, we, we do sometimes have uh, diverse views of what happened. But we, we walk through it. We, we, uh, I remember one particular accident we had that was a particularly difficult one to solve. And we uh, met every day for a month. Every day at the end of the day, we'd sit at this table and we'd say, well, what happened? And one by one, we'd go around the table and say, I don't know. I don't know. We haven't figured it out. And it was pretty depressing, but eventually we did. So um, in the end, when you're out there working and it's you know, a lot of pressure and, a lot of, a lot, and you're tired and, and everything else, you know, that's when you're not at your best necessarily, but really it's when you have to be at your best, especially with your coworkers out there. And so it, it really requires exceptional people skills, I'm told. We all have challenges we have to face at the accident site. As I said, uh, there's, there's uh, some kind of uh, confusion sometimes among the first responders uh, of who's really in charge because uh, it's kind of a changing scene. I mean, the firemen will typically respond first. If there's a fire, they're out there, and then the law enforcement people show up, and then the medical examiner comes. Well, who, who's really in charge? And uh, sometimes the people that are in charge are on their way. They're not there yet. The NTSB has to travel. And uh, there are only 10 regional offices in the country, and so it takes time to get uh, out to some of these places. And uh, in the meantime, we all have to uh, get along and, and, uh, and uh, you know, follow the leaders, so to speak. So there's this, there's this continual chain of command that's kind of moving. And a lot of the people that, that um, support these accidents don't understand that. Well, wait a minute. I thought he was in charge. Now, now this guy showed up. Now, now you're in charge. What's going on? And so, uh, you know, we have to be kind and gentle about this, but uh, definitely the NTSB is in charge. And in my, many of my seminars, I would, I would tell the firemen this, and they weren't sure. Well, my chief is my boss. Well, yes, he is. But in the uh, art of investigation, it's the NTSB. And wreckage can be, can be located in a number of places, uh, you know, underwater, up on top of a hill, in somebody's house. You know, they're everywhere. And um, uh, you just have to deal with it. And... Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a calculated risk there. A lot of the pieces may be missing. It's not a given that all of the airplane is going to be where the hole is. You know, it, 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 we may have had pieces coming off of it for miles. And, um, and so we have to go out there and find every one of these pieces as well because it's all part of the puzzle. puzzle. Sometimes we do find pieces, but they're in a condition that renders them worthless to us because we can't recognize what they are. They're all burned up or bent up. There's no part number on it, but we know that it's uh, probably from the airplane. And uh, I remember one investigation, we had uh, a bunch of people out there walking around helping us pick up pieces. It was, the airplane actually crashed in a prison. <laughs> so we had some captive labor there and, and uh, it was snowing and, and uh, we were looking for a very small piece of the aileron system. And, and so we thought that these, uh, these prisoners would be willing to help us. And sure enough, they all volunteered because they wanted something new to do. And we uh, gave each of them a little bag and we marched them out in, in waves and we covered the whole the whole prison ground, which was rather enormous. And um, at, the, uh, at the end of the search, we, we removed their bags from them, and one by one, we emptied them on a table, and we started finding things that uh, weren't necessarily airplane parts. We found a windshield wiper and some other stuff, pieces of lawnmowers and, and what, whatever you can imagine. And uh, we took one of these pieces back to our engineers because, uh, uh, as a joke, because we knew it was part of a lawnmower, but we weren't sure if he did. So we put it on his desk, and he kept it on his uh, desk for about a week before he figured out, no, that's not an airplane part. So, so uh, there, you have to have humor in this job, let me tell you. It's called gallows humor, and sometimes you have to make fun of it, but it's the only way you can keep your sanity, because some of these things, when you get out there, are pretty horrible, as you can imagine. We have to deal with a lot of that, and it is the pure horror. And uh, I've seen people get out there and uh, just be completely overloaded. Their senses are just totally overloaded. I mean, you know you're going to an airplane accident, and Okay, you're walking toward it, and yeah, that looks like maybe the tail. And closer you get, you may find that you don't recognize anything. And, or if you do, you understand that, well, that's an altimeter, but, but why is it there? And, and, and gosh, there's an HSI, and what is it doing there? And uh, Oh, here's the guy's hat. You know, It's all these conflicting uh, senses that you have to deal with, but it's all part of the puzzle, and it's, uh, it's huge. Politics. 
there's always somebody somewhere that wants to be part of the accident investigation that's really not allowed to be there. And the NTSB has very specific guidelines as to who can be on site. They don't allow attorneys on site or corporate officers, for example, to be there. As you can imagine, uh, they have uh, an ulterior motive sometimes or want to steer the investigation their way or the other. You can't do that. We have to be very objective in our findings and what we're doing there. And politics are always banging on the door, and we always rely on the uh, NTSB investigator in charge to deal with the po politicians. Uh, of course, sometimes the family, uh, you know, the people that survive this thing will want to be there and, and uh, want to see, you know, where their husband or loved one died, and so we, we make arrangements for them to come on site too. But we have to deal with it. And the media. The media is always looking for 6 o'clock headlines, and it's always difficult to deal with them because they're just in the entertainment business, really, and I, I guess I guess you can tell I'm not really a, a fan of the media. Uh, I think the news is important, but I think it needs to be objective and not sensational. And the media is always uh, trying to spy on us. Uh, we've found them with uh, directional microphones that can go about 1,000 yards, and their cameras are taking pictures of our notes and so on. They're eavesdropping on our conversations. And they broadcast them at the 6 o'clock news. That's actually happened to me. So we're not real fond of the media being out of control like that. And so typically, uh, when they approach us and want to interview us, uh, we're just the, the team. We always refer them to the uh, NTSB uh, investigator in charge. He is the spokesperson for the investigation. That helps a lot. And a lot of people talk about the inconvenience. Gee, you're in your nice warm bed in Duluth, Minnesota in the middle of winter. It's only 20 below out there. And you've got to get up and go somewhere. You're not sure where and to an accident. And um, so a lot of people don't like being inconvenienced, being on call all this time. So that's kind of difficult. Strong sense of humor helps. We called it the gallows humor. I'm sure you've watched Law and Order, and some of those uh, TV shows where Lenny Briscoe, the detective, always has a smart aleck remark to make. That's, that's not uncommon, and we're not a bunch of uh, frivolous folks, and uh, we're not that jolly either, but we do have to get through the horror of it all. I call it the ashtray phase of the investigation. You've got to be objective, and you've simply got to be able to get through that uh, terrible, terrible, terrible loss of people. And once you do that, you can do a good job. So sometimes we, we tend to kid each other, and it sounds pretty sick to outsiders, I would guess, but uh, it keeps us going anyway, and certainly has with me. At the same time, you have to have a lot of compassion. Gee, this could have been me. Poor guy. What's his family going to do? You know, and those questions come at you the whole time you're there, forever. And I don't think I've ever forgotten a single accident I've been to. I can tell you exactly what I saw for years, and I'll probably never get rid of it. So that compassion is always there. There are four phases of an accident. As you might imagine, there's the rescue phase. That's when the firemen are there. We always do everything we can to, to help the victims. And um, if there's uh, no hope for them, then there's always the possibilities of fire or hazardous things going on. Some of these new aircraft have systems on board, like the parachutes, these ballistic parachutes and, uh, and inflatable restraints. They have some ordnance in them. And if those weren't used in the course of the accident, then they're live ordnance, and we have to deal with that, too. The investigation phase uh, comes next, and hopefully the fire department has sealed off the site so that we don't have a lot of folks running around out there. A lot of people like to take souvenirs from, from accidents. I don't know why. That seems kind of grisly to me. But we need those things to help us uh, determine what happened. And of course, at the end of this, sometimes um, we call it the recovery phase. We might recover the, uh, the wreckage right from the site. But more often than not, it's in an inconvenient spot. And so we have to move it someplace where we can examine it in more detail, in more privacy. And so every time you move uh, the wreckage, of course, you're losing evidence. Stuff falls off the truck, or you forgot something at the site, or whatever. And so uh, it is perishable, and we, we really hate to move things. We like to keep it in situ as long as we can. But the recovery phase is important because uh, it is an inconvenience for the farmer's field where this thing took place, or somebody's house. We need to get it out of there and put it in a place where that we, can, we can actually do a professional job taking a look at every little piece. We actually lay it out and try to account for all the parts of the airplane. So the recovery phase is very important. And sometimes the recovery phase happens before the investigation starts. If we can't get there for a day or so and somebody's got to get it off, off the highway, well, you know, uh, we're not going to see it the way it was when it actually happened. So that's difficult. And finally, the legal phase. When it's all said and done, there's attorneys out there and they want to blame somebody. And uh, we have to deal with that as well. And as investigators, typically we do get deposed and asked to uh, make our comments known to the legal world. So here's a rescue phase. This is not uncommon. Uh, in this particular case, it was a fatal, and, and uh, all you can do is uh, 
try to put out the fires and, and just uh, deal with it. I show these lockers, this row of lockers. People say, well, what's it like to do an investigation? And I say, well, it's not looking at lockers, but the, the symbology is here. If you can think of each of those locker doors as a clue or a part of the investigation that you have to do, a possibility, engine failure, fuel failure, whatever, lack of uh, too much air in the tanks, as we say, um, look at these lockers and consider each of those a clue. And when we get there, all of those locker doors are open. And when the investigation's over, we, we've needed to have all those doors closed. There might be two or three left open. Those are the, that's where we focus our investigation. So there's a lot, a lot of uh, things we have to ask questions about and, and, and get the answers to. So what does happen when the phone rings? Well, a call can come from anyone, anytime. And um, if it's an 800 number, you know you hang up. <laughs> but uh, typically the NTSB people will call us and let us know that we need to participate in this thing. And uh, they'll ask us to send somebody there. The very first thing we ask is, can we have party status? And that's granted right then and there or not. And when we get to the site, we do have to fill out a party investigation form that puts us legally into the investigation for the NTSB as, as the representative for our manufacturer. And that's, uh, that's part of the protocol of what you have to do. But the first thing you do when the phone rings is ask for permission to go. They don't want you traveling halfway across the country if they don't need you. And we don't want to spend the money either, but we're anxious to be there, that's for sure. So the investigator on call has to be prepared to go anywhere, anytime. So you have to have your medical uh, uh, stuff in order. If you're gonna go overseas, you've gotta have your passport ready and all your tools and stuff uh, that you may need on site ready to go. We call that a go bag. And of course, the very first thing you do is verify that it's a, a legitimate accident. We've had people call up and uh, they think they're being cute, but they will report an accident, which is really a false alarm. And it uh, really is, is pretty uh, a terrible thing to go through because we get pretty wound up when there's an accident, as you can imagine. There's a lot to do and, and uh, the adrenaline's pumping and we've got to find transportation and uh, we don't need a, a false alarm at that point. So we ask all the appropriate uh, W questions, where, when, who, all that stuff. And uh, we request the status. And then if we can, if we have time, we'll brief our internal uh, people in the, in the company. Now we always had carte blanche to launch anytime, anywhere. If we felt it, would, it was uh, something we had to go to, we didn't ask questions and they didn't either. We just left. But if we have time, we try to uh, brief them on what we think happened, uh, you know, at least where it is, what, what the early reports are and then we get on out of there. And at Cirrus, we were lucky. We had internal airplanes that could fly us to some of these things. And we also made a policy of the investigator not being the pilot, either coming or going, because uh, we were always a little bit stressed both ways. So we always had somebody from the company fly us there. Uh, the internal team uh, works their contacts as well. I mean, we're always looking at the newscasts and uh, trying to get footage and so forth, because sometimes we can learn something just from the film. And a lot of our, our news uh, folks are are uh, really cooperative and they, they help us with footage. Uh, they're pretty good about that. So we get to the uh, site as soon as we can. And here's uh, Brad Miller, one of our, he's running the department now that I'm retired. Uh, we call this the well-dressed uh, air safety investigator. He's got this, uh, Brad was a ranger in the army. And he's, he's not opposed to carrying 80 pounds on his back, plus your clothes that you're gonna need. And uh, this is what you look like when you go. Roller bags are really important. And we carry a lot of stuff. Um, you never know where you're going. You don't know if it's going to be an accident, an incident, a fender bender, until sometimes you get there. Once you get on an airliner and you're heading out there, you're out of touch with the real world. The phone calls keep coming in at the company, and so those people uh, will gather all that information, and the minute we touch down, they'll give us a brief on what they've learned. And of course, when you get to the site, the uh, NTSB will brief you. This case um, was a windstorm. There was no uh, federal oversight or, or required to, meant to be there. But this uh, field in Ohio got hit with a big storm and there were a number of airplanes that had uh, been flipped over and moved around on the airfield. This particular Cirrus was in its protective hangar and the windstorm picked up the Cirrus and the hangar and deposited it some hundred yards or so down the way and then the uh, main beam of the hangar came down and uh, pretty much cut the airplane in half and uh, the owner called me and said, Mike, Mike, they're trying to move my airplane, talk to them. And so I got hold of the airport manager. I said, you know, you don't want to be doing that. Said, Why? We've got to get it out of there. I said, well, you know, there's a ballistic recovery system in there. and It only takes a quarter of an inch of movement on the activation handle for that uh, rocket to go off. Didn't know that. <laughs> so I said, well, don't move it. And uh, there is a picture here. I don't know if you can see it. This arrow is off a little bit. But you can see that uh, one of our investigators 
Uh, I'll try to get it right there. That's Mark Manning's foot. And we sent him down there, and uh, he is in the process of, of um, actually disarming the rocket. And of course, it's in a puddle of gasoline there because it ruptured the tanks and so on. The airplane was totaled. But at least we got some safety on site and uh, nobody was hurt. But people don't know about these things, and so they, they tend to make rash decisions in a hurry. They think it's the right thing to do. We, um, we often launched on things that weren't covered by the NTSB. At the site, you've got to secure the site, pre preserve evidence, and beware of the hazards which may be present. Uh, and there are a lot of them. I mean, you've got, uh, you know, critters and animals and, you know, all kinds of things that you don't think about that might be there. Uh, this was a site that I uh, responded to, uh, one of my very first ones. Uh, the NTSB called me and asked me to come up to New Jersey, and uh, uh, I said, are, are you aware that there's a ballistic parachute on that airplane? He said, no, I didn't know that. And I said, well, uh, I think you need to uh, understand we've got perhaps a hazard there. Well, what do you want me to do? I said, well, at least keep everybody out of there until I can get there. Now, this doesn't always happen, but as you can see in this case, there's some pink ribbon around this thing, and it doesn't look much like an airplane, I know. But uh, if you look here, those are my footprints. That, uh, you know, I got there about uh, eight hours later. Nobody had disturbed the site whatsoever. I was the first guy on site. And of course, I found the rocket, which was over by the tree there. And uh, we were in business in about five minutes. The rocket was inert, and we were able to get on with the investigation with no further ado. But sometimes there's just nothing. You get out there, and it's just this big, vast wasteland, and you and the, and the airplane and, and the victims, there you are. Or sometimes it can be in a fairly uh, dense environment. This was, this was in uh, Florida, actually. So on the first day on site, what happens? Well, the parties all get together with the NTSB. And he, the, uh, he or she, the investigator in charge, will brief everybody on what we know. Uh, we'll also review all the rules, what kind of restrictions that there may be that may be applying to this or the expectations. And, um, you know, what do we expect of you? All right. And, of course, we sign the ever-present party form. And uh, the IIC will explain how the investigation will proceed. And also, we're given assignments. You know, you'll do this, you'll do that. In addition to all of our normal things, the first thing I would do normally is disarm the, uh, the rocket and the airbag system and uh, then deal with the rest of the, of the airframe. Time is short. People think that you're out there forever. And in fact, uh, over a period of time, I averaged it up, we sometimes uh, get no more than about four hours on site. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, pressures to get this thing done in a hurry, which is our enemy. Time is our enemy there. And so um, we don't always get the, the amount of time that we need. So we work quickly and, and very, very efficiently, I think. So we have a plan, we work the plan, and we try to determine what the priorities are. We condition, like I said, I, I determine the condition of the uh, Cirrus airframe parachute system and the uh, restraints, inflatable restraints. We walk the site just to get an idea of uh, what we're dealing with. We note the energy path and direction, and right then and there, we take what we call contingency photos. Because you don't know if your camera's gonna run out of batteries or if the cold's gonna get to your, to your many cameras that you carry and render them uh, useless. For a while there, we all uh, bought the same kinds of cameras so we could swap batteries back and forth and chargers and so on. And uh, we're still doing that to some extent, but we take a lot of early pictures, we call them contingency photos, just so we've got something in case everything uh, falls apart technology-wise. And if we have time and the space, we'll lay out what we think is the wreckage in the shape that the airplane should be, the tail at the back and so on. And uh, we do an inventory right then and there to try to figure out if we've got all the parts. And if we don't, we go look for them. And if we do, then we, we review it very carefully. Take detailed notes. And um, this is a slide I show in some of the presentations. Uh, we do have to disarm this stuff. I mean, it is a hazard, and, and it's unexpended ordnance. And so uh, uh, what sign says is, I'm a bomb technician. If you see me running, try to keep up. Uh, that's almost a joke, but at the same time, pretty serious about what we do. And a lot of firemen, you know, firemen uh, live in the firehouse together. They're a very close-knit team as opposed to police officers, which are fairly independent people, each in their own squad car and so on. Firemen tend to uh, spend a lot of time in the dorm, if you will, and they, they do like to play pranks on each other. And so we've got to kind of watch them carefully. I always show them this slide uh, to <laughs> get them aware of the fact that we really don't joke around when we're dealing with ordnance. Um, we try to document everything before it's moved, if possible. There's always a big hurry to move things. 
So we ask the firemen to make sketches and uh, take videos if they can before we get there. And, uh, you know, they're getting pretty good about that. A lot of the trucks have video cameras mounted right in them, and we can see what, they're, what all they're doing. And uh, we also try to line up these shots with a prominent landmark because uh, just looking at a picture with no reference points can be very difficult to figure out later. And take multiple shots. We average about 1,000 pictures apiece uh, on a site. I know it's a lot to look at, but you're always missing that one shot you wish you'd taken, you know. A lot of these airplanes don't have voice recorders or the digital, digital black boxes. We're getting better about the black box part, but we're still not there. We're not at the airline thousand channel boxes anymore. We're not there yet. So we have to do it the old fashioned way. And uh, we have to, uh, for example, look at these uh, marks on a tree to see if we can figure out what the angle of, uh, of uh, impact was from either a propeller or a wheel or perhaps a wing or something like that. And um, we also look at the registration number. Who's it registered to? We'll figure that out very quickly. Look at the data plate and try to figure out who owns it. This is an interesting story that Jeff Gazzetti, who's uh, one of the higher ups in NTSB now, but when I first met him, he was an investigator with Cessna. And uh, he said, well, you know, you need to take a model with you of the airplane if you can, because a lot of times uh, when you're talking to uh, a witness, they don't know all the terminology for aircraft and all the things that we do. Uh, a loop and a roll and a whifferdill and a uh, you know, Lumpschewach is all the same thing to them. And so if you put a model in their hands, they can sort of trace the path of the airplane, show you what it was doing, and you can make your own conclusions from that. And that works out pretty well. So uh, we went out and bought these uh, airplanes. Now, they didn't look like Cirruses, but they were durable metal ones, low wing, uh, with the engine in front sort of thing. Uh, Jeff had cautioned us that he had a rather expensive model that he took to this particular accident uh, when he was with Cessna. And uh, he gave the model to one of the, uh, to one of the witnesses. And uh, he said, well, would you trace the path of the aircraft for us, sir? And the guy said, well, sure. Uh, here you go. Uh, it went up, and then, and then it crashed. <laughs> And he said, boy, that model cost me a lot of money. <laughs> so uh, we, we learned early on to buy lots of cheap ones that were fairly durable. At the end of the day, first day, you wrap up the meeting, you get everybody together. Well, what did we learn? And uh, we try to review all the things that uh, we know and what's missing, and we draw up a, a battle plan for the next day. And typically, the, we'll all go out and have uh, some kind of dinner together if we try to. Uh, I know it's tough to do, but we may not get together until 9, 10 o'clock that night, but we'll, we try to have a little bit of time to kind of put the accident aside just to uh, relax just a little bit and get ready for the next day. You're working a lot of long hours out there, and it's pretty tough on everybody. And this whole process can take several days. We've, we've been on site for you know, a week at a time sometimes. I know I said four hours earlier, but that's an average. The myths, there are lots of them out there. Uh, the plane always blows up and burns. Uh, with my experience with Sirius, less than a third of the Sirius accidents had fire involved. Um, you know, it's made out of fiberglass, it's going to burn. No, it doesn't always. The uh, plane doesn't blow up either. The engine always sputters and quits before impact. Well, there's some truth to that. It doesn't mean that there's a bad engine. It means that the pilot's probably pulling the mixture back, so, <laughs> you know, to minimize problems. Um, but it, uh, the witnesses always, always say that it sputters and quits before impact. Read the next accident report you get, and you'll hear that. Um, the pilot in command was the best pilot ever. And uh, we know and we know that a huge percentage of accidents are uh, human factors oriented. Not necessarily a bad pilot, but he had a bad day perhaps. And uh, so uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a tough one because you're dealing with the family and I think he was, uh, you know, the ace of the base and uh, he didn't even do a pre-flight. So, so you never know. Anyway, those myths are important, and uh, we also laugh at this one. One person always solves the mystery. You get the guy with the golden BB. Aha! I know what it is. Now, I don't think that's ever happened to us. We always do it as a team, and we work together, and we kind of evolve to the answer is how it works. And of course, black boxes aren't black. A lot of people don't know that. This is, these are flight data recorders from airliners. And uh, the recovery phase is, is, like I say, sometimes precedes the investigation, or sometimes is after we've been there. This particular service was, um, went into a river, and uh, of course we had to pull it out after disarming all the goodies, and the airplane was underwater at the time. So uh, it was bobbing up and down, and we only have a quarter of an inch of cable to play with on these, on these rockets. Cockpit and the uh, fuselage was full of gasoline, and uh, there I was in my rowboat all by myself out there. So it was interesting. But it was important to know that when I showed up, they all knew, all the first responders had heard that there was a ballistic parachute on board, 
And they said, we're sure glad you're here. And they were all standing back, and there's your boat. Go do. So <laughs> we did. <laughs> um, so the recovery phase means that the airplane is going to be moved probably again and that you've got the possibility of losing evidence. Uh, we get into a lot of component testing. Sometimes it's pretty rude and crude. We'll hook the fuel pump up to a battery to see if it pumps and we'll check things, certain things that we can on site. We'll check the engine for thumb pressure and so forth. Um, we try to get a, a general feel for what's going on. And um, at the end of the day, again, we're going to review the facts summary from each of the investigators that are there. Sometimes uh, you'll spend a couple days just building a road to get to the thing. This is one we did in California. It was in a thousand foot valley. And we actually had to build a road to get the tractors and trucks in there to be able to get the wreckage out. So uh, then you transport it to a storage facility, typically, where it's stored. Uh, and we also do a fair amount of layout uh, investigation right then and there. But it's stored for some period of time until insurance people can look at it. And of course, the legal folks will have a look at it when it's all over. This is a typical wreckage layout at one of these facilities. This one's in Arizona. And you can see that uh, the white part of, part of it there is the cowling. It's heading to the right. And um, the rest of it is the spar and the rest of the airplane. It was all there, believe it or not. Uh, the rest of it was on the trailer, and we found every piece of it. So when we get home, what do we do then? Well, the accident investigation continues. We have to brief senior management on what we found. And of course, the NTSB investigation is ongoing. And then we share all the data with all the other parties. We exchange pictures and uh, preliminary reports. We all talk a lot. And then uh, we'll send our preliminary report to the investigator in charge. And uh, at that point, uh, we write our own report internally. They're not different. They're just, they're just uh, ours is pretty lengthy. Our prelim report to the NTSB is fairly short. And we sometimes have to do other trips. We average about three trips per accident. They might be to forensic investigations, engine teardown investigations, that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's what we do. We look at everything, simply everything. Engine teardowns, autopilots, fuel systems, electrical components, the structure, landing gear, avionics, it's all there. And uh, it's all important because it could be part of the problem. This is a blue engine box some of you may recognize. This is uh, what the Continental Company uses to transport their engines in. And typically, if uh, we're going to look at the engine in detail, the box uh, comes to a site. The FAA takes custody of the engine, puts the engine in the box, and seals it, and uh, is custodian of that evidence. They'll send it down to the Continental Company in uh, Alabama. Mobile is where their home uh, office is. And uh, that will be placed in quarantine until we can schedule a time for that to be, to be examined. And uh, all the parties from the investigation are invited to come to that. We always go. And uh, so we're there with the investigator in charge. And of course, I'll be there. And then the uh, folks from Continental will be there. They have some expert mechanics who are really good at taking these things apart. And uh, we will do it step by step by step, right down to the nuts and bolts. Here's what it might look like. This one was involved in a fire. And it's all sealed, of course. And uh, we take it right down to the various components. Here we are testing some spark plugs, for example. Uh, this was a MCU, or an electrical components box. That arrow is off again, but just below the body of the arrow, you'll see a difference in color there. That's, that's a, uh, a piece of the, uh, of the PC or the card that actually uh, burned and uh, has a discontinuity there. So the initial report schedule that the NTSB will put out uh, you can find that on www.faa.gov. The FAA usually reports it first, and that's on the web for about 10 days. Uh, it's usually gone in 10 days. It'll be on there in one to three days. And sometimes this is the first notification that we'll have that something happened. Uh, sometimes you get a little fender bender, you know, somebody hit a taxi light or whatever. But it could also be something more. Uh, then the NTSB on www.ntsb.gov, on the aviation portion of it, Within 10 days, uh, they will put in a preliminary report. Now, prelims are, are typically wrong. I mean, they might get the place and the time sort of correct. And um, you've probably read them, you know, on such and such a date, such and thus happened. But it is a preliminary report. It's just a report that they're working on it, and uh, the details are pretty sketchy. They're pretty short, maybe two or three paragraphs. And um, so you're not going to get a lot from that other than the fact that, you know, a Cirrus went down in uh, Allentown or someplace. And then, um, uh, of course, the final report that the NTSB does 
can be on the public docket and on the web as well. Now, as the time goes on, you're going to see a preliminary report, then a factual report, and so on and so on uh, from the NTSB. And eventually, uh, it could take six months, it could take two years, depending on the severity and the, and the complexity of the accident. Uh, but you keep checking the web and you'll see if they've got something new on there. And uh, in the end, you'll find that they will publish the probable cause as well. Sometimes the, uh, they'll have a public hearing and the, and the uh, probable cause is announced at that. Uh, these are some of the larger accidents that you might see with airliners and so forth. I don't think we've ever had one. And uh, in the probable cause, you know, you can, you can agree or disagree, but there it is. Always on the web, take a look there. Um, we'll also take a, take a look at this thing from an internal company point of view. We'll look at this report and say, well, you know, this didn't cause the accident. We don't have any reason to believe that this was bad, but we did find something here that broke that really shouldn't have broken in this case. And we'll take a look at that and see if there's something we need to improve in the product. And so we, we do that internally. We'll, we'll go have a meeting and kind of review the accident and bring in some of the engineers and people that can make some decisions and, and uh, review the fact that this broke and we need to maybe fix it. Even though it didn't cause the accident, it, it could be a potential. So we have critical people at this one, and uh, I think each company has their own process. Ours sort of changes from time to time, but, but uh, eventually we'll get around to writing this report, which would look something like this. These reports can be pretty, pretty detailed and lengthy. There's an awful lot of work involved there. And finally, the legal phase. Always somebody wants to sue you for something, and um, you have to deal with it, you know, and, and so we uh, usually first see that we're going to get sued when we're asked to produce documents, which we do, and um, then we have to go to wreckage inspections. So what's, once more, they'll drag the wreckage out of storage, and now the attorneys can take a look at it, and we always go as well, in case we uh, missed something the first time around, just to make sure that we didn't, and to, uh, you know, verify everything. Also, keep everybody honest, and uh, we will also be deposed by, by the opposing attorneys. And of course, we get into more component testing. Now, these aren't necessarily the components that broke or we found in the accident, but it could be an exemplar fuel pressure gauge or a pump or something, and uh, we'll be, be doing some testing. There's always the contention that something failed. This can take years, and it goes on and on and on. Wreckage inspection starts with a basket of parts like this, and we'll lay it out like that, and uh, you know, it goes on and on. Anyway, we want you to have a, a good day when you're flying. We want you to keep the shiny side up. And uh, I may be a little early, so we may have time for questions. I don't know if there are questions on the floor. We have a process. Walt's got the mic. Two questions. Uh, uh, dates for the FAA and NTSB dates that appear in the computer, is that the do they appear on the date they are published or listed there or the, ac the actual accident date? February 6th or whatever. Yes, they, they have the actual accident date there, and as much detail as the report can give you is there. Uh, these reports are refined and edited to a fairly well, and um, they're, they're pretty easy to read. Some of them are pretty long, but they're as factual and as honest and straightforward as they can be. I think they do a great job. It's a very difficult job to do. Yes, I had uh, an engine out at one point about in November of 2007, and the, uh, it was a, a piston failure. And the engine kept running long enough for me to find an airport and safely land. That's a good thing. I land, yes, I landed as if uh, it, it landed as if nothing had happened, as if nothing went wrong at all. And uh, and I'm heard that you know that's good news and bad news. Yes, sir. And the the downside is that since I landed th and, and there was no loss of life or property, the NTSB could care less. They never came and investigated it. I was told that the FAA was coming. The maintenance shop where I landed sent me home, said, get out of here, we'll call the FAA, we'll take care of everything. Two days later, I showed up and said, well, did they show up? And they, I was told that they had, but I never saw a report or anything or any record or anything. Um, you probably need to contact the local FISDO there to see what it is they found, because um, the FAA will come out to these, uh, we would call something like that a fender bender, no offense. But obviously something did break, and, and there could have been a good reason for it, and uh, we want to we want to know what that was. Why did that piston fail? And um, yeah. you know, okay, yeah. yeah, analytical summary. Yep. Yeah. 
Well, typically, there's um, the FAA has a lot more resources than the the uh, NTSB. Just to give you a, a, a kind of a comparison, the FAA has over 50,000 employees in 100 uh, regional offices. Okay, FISDOS. Uh, the NTSB has, by law, is by law limited to 500 employees, most of which reside in Washington. There are 10 regions and about 39, I think right now, maybe 42 active accident investigators. 42. They're pretty thin. So thin. Uh, I don't know if that report would be on the FAA website. Probably not. But if you go to the FISDO uh, of where you were, they'll, they'll cough it up for you, I'm sure. Yes, sir. What do I mean by party status means that you're a party to the investigation or a member of the investigative team. It's a, it's a crummy term. We, we're not having any fun out there, I can assure you. But uh, party means you're a party to the investigation. And it is, it's a legal term, and it's part of, the f part of the document that we have to sign. It's called a party status agreement. And we do have to actually sign it to become uh, a member of the investigative team, if you will. Uh, they don't pay us. No, we're still paid by our by our home uh, manufacturer or home employer, but, but we do uh, act on their behalf. If they want us to go do something, we all do it. And um, we do have our individual priorities, but we don't do anything without their knowledge or permission. It is their investigation, make no mistake about that. And because we can be invited, we can also be uninvited. <laughs> so once we're out there, if we, if we do something wrong and uh, uh, you, know, you never want to do that, they'll ask you to go home. That would be a very, very long day in any accident investigator's uh, career is to be asked to leave an accident, trust me. Mike, we have a question over here. Yes, sir. Yes, um, can you comment on the uh, role that logbooks, airframe and uh, power plant logbooks play in an investigation and then uh, what would happen if there was a gap, if there's one logbook missing, for example? Well, any documentation is hugely important to any investigation and we do our utmost very best to capture or contain or, or get hold of all of it. Uh, while we sometimes can't necessarily get hold of the actual log, uh, we do look for facsimiles or, or copies of them. Typically the FAA will help us do that. Uh, they have a lot of this on file, but sometimes people will carry their log books with them in the aircraft, for example, including their own pilot log. And uh, in the crash, sometimes that evidence is uh, destroyed, burned up or broken or lost or whatever. Or it gets rained on or it's underwater and, and destroyed. And so. Uh, any kind of missing documents or any holes in those uh, chain of uh, words, if you will, uh, really hurt us a lot because uh, there are questions that come about them. And uh, we have to do what we can to fill in the blanks. If the guy took it to his typical shop, uh, we may not have the logbook, but we'll have the mechanic. And uh, that's a good thing. I've got five more minutes left. If anyone else has a question, I'll be glad to answer it at this time, or you can see me afterwards in the darkened studio where we can chat one on one as far as going back to accident um, seeing when one occurs and trying to find the historical weather what's a good site for us to find historical weather data um, in near accident site that's a really good question and I don't remember right now I'll tell you why there uh, there are vendors out there that you can pay to look up uh, weather information that they store and you can go back to a given date to these people and say, okay, on this date or the days preceding or following it, can you give us the weather for uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and the area? And they'll cough it up. They'll give you everything that was ever published or, or, or metered. And uh, those professional people do a really good job. They'll send us a packet about that thick, and you can get very accurate weather that way. That's how we do it now. I don't know of a site that's uh, particularly good at it right now. They're not cheap. <laughs> yes, no, uh, the uh, the big packet of uh, reports that you showed up there, real thick and so on. Where do you store them, and how long do you store them for life? And do you transfer well, them? Well, each company has their own policy on document retention, and uh, you're uh, you're uh, supposed to have that down legally uh, before you try to keep them or not keep them. That has to be in your company's policies. Uh, they're stored in a you know, as you can imagine, a safe environment. Um, we, for example, when we take pictures, the original card that comes out of the camera is what we save. We make a copy of that for our investigation purposes. So all the original stuff is preserved, and uh, it, it will vary from company to company on how long it's kept. I'm curious. I'm sure in some uh, investigations the, the team is has a consensus. 
and perhaps in other cases there's disagreement or, or ambiguity. So uh, are there cases where the NTSB ultimately comes out with a report that perhaps you might not agree with in entirety? Absolutely. Uh, not very often, but uh, probable causes have been changed. A friend of mine was involved in an accident right here at Lakeland, as a matter of fact. And um, uh, in time, he, he didn't agree with the probable cause, and he took it up channels, and I have to say I helped him. Um, but we opened it up, got it opened up again, and all the facts were reviewed, and in fact, the probable cause was changed from pilot error. So it can change. They, they say probable cause, but they're always open and subject to, to reinterpretation. I think that's my cue. <laughs> I guess we can still talk. Is there a legal requirement for survivors uh, to provide uh, documentation like aircraft log books and pilot logs? Or is that something that is uh, open to uh, interpretation by the survivors? Well, you know, people, people um, you know, a death of a pilot or any, any loved one is a difficult thing for any family to go through. And uh, we've had situations where they said, yes, we'll give you everything that uh, Charlie had. We'll give you his tools and access to his shop and all his drawings and stuff. And uh, later on, went to follow up on that and they wouldn't let us have it. So uh, it, it can vary from place to place. Uh, it's very helpful to have the documentation to see you know, what happened there. If he's got the logs, it's very, very helpful. If not, then we have to go about other ways to finding it. For example, um, uh, sometimes you know people that flew with them or, or friends or so forth. Sometimes they'll come forth with, with information. Somebody may have helped him build the airplane, for example, or worked on it, or did the annual. And so you can get the information kind of in a different way. It's best to get the written document, but sometimes the family just won't cough it up. So I think, uh, you know, it's a very important piece of it, but we don't always get it, again, back to probable cause. I really appreciate your help today and uh, the fact that you came out here so early in the morning to, to listen to us. And if there's something we can do to help you, don't hesitate to call. Uh, I'm retired now, but I'm still working at it. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Walt. Stay right here. Stay right I, here. Now we know what you do when the phone rings. That's right. Does it ring very much? It used to ring a lot. <laughs> oh, that's bad in that business. <laughs> well, sometimes it's the same, uh, you know, same accident and 14 people call you, so. <laughs> I understand that's so like on the highway. Yep. Yeah, I was on the side of the highway for 16 hours. Nobody called. There you go. Yeah, I don't get no respect. <laughs> you and Rodney. If there's anybody has any questions, please come up and see Mike. You might have a personal question. I'll be glad to answer it. There's a lot of information out there, and particularly if you start at ntsb.gov, it'll lead you back to some of these other sites and accidents. Yes. Thank you. Stay Thank right you. here. We're Stay right here. Camera. We're still on camera. Okay. Live and in color. <laughs> Hello there, young feller. Hi. Uh, I'm a member of the American Banana Society. Uh, okay. I appreciate your contribution to the uh, news, uh, newsletter, and not newsletter, but magazine. Okay. I wonder how you have the time to do that. I'll tell you, it's very simple. There are two Mike Bush.